What up, y'all? Rap Critic here. And you know the year ain't really concluded until your boy hits you with the best rap joints. And with such an awful year as it was, I know y'all trying to feel something good, so I wanted to make sure I hit you with the tracks that really stood out. Joints that had such a unique, inimitable charm or definitive approach to a topic that encapsulated through music the feeling they were going for, that you really felt the impact of their artistry, which marked them just a cut above the rest of what else came out this year. So here's my video for top 10 best rap songs of 2021. Oh, but before we get started, if you enjoy my stuff and want to support the show, head on over to patreon.com slash rapcritic, where if you become a $2 patron, you can help me reach my $1,500 a month goal, as well as get a bunch of fun perks like vote on episodes, movie and game nights on discords, exclusive episodes of my movie podcasts, and other perks you see here. So get with it, act like you want it, and let's get on with the episode. Had to throw in at least one good posse cut, and I kept coming back to this one for just how cool this four-man team worked in sync to bring the track together. You figured there's a mixer in my wine house, pull up my time out, rejected it, never with them before I sign out. The time's now, they see the team eating, they want to try out, I see niggas who blink, they the realest turn into buy outs. Just taking in how they'd sporadically jump in and overlap through each other's rhymes at continually unexpected places. If I lie, it's only me praising them through my sideline, only I lie, get it to speak to people who in my eyes are genuine, and never been hateful when I be my sky. Picasso painted my mind, the wickedest with the outlines. With the chilled out jazzy lo-fi backbeat providing a nice contrast to their hype cadences that speed up as the track goes on randomly having parts that switch up into spanish in a way that's so nimble with it even if you don't know what they're saying you're just enjoying the smooth way the swiftness of their deliveries flip it and a special shout out to samad the savage who gets fucking busy in some of his solo bits it's a deceptively complex track that registers as light and fun despite the labyrinthine rhymes that build and play off of each other, so I had to give props to how these four wordsmiths pulled it off so breezily. I caught it bad just today. You hear me what I call to your place. Yeah, yeah, you know I had to put this one on here, but you can't act like you don't know why. It's in how his language tells an even more layered story the more you look into it. And also the production with the slick Spanish guitar and the beat work and how he utilizes the lower register in his voice for the rich timbre of hums and harmonies layered throughout the track. And of course, the more salacious lyrics that bring the whole experience together. And the award for filthiest pop lyric with technically no bad words in it goes to... Lil Nas X. Now, while it mostly feels like a pop track, I do enjoy the cadence of the pockets of rhymes he throws in in the second verse that give it the more direct crossover genre feel. And while some might be sticklers about the rhyme at the beginning of the verse... I wanna sell what you're buying. I wanna fill all your ass in I'm actually pretty lenient on a rhyme scheme as long as the artist can make it sound organic in its delivery. Like, this next part is about to get a little granular concerning my analysis on rhyme construction, but I mean, I covered the broader stuff in my initial review, so why the hell not? See, the secret of bending rhymes of words that might not typically go together is all about if you can deliver it in a way that doesn't sound strained, so it functions within the flow of the rhyme. For contrast, and sorry to make you think of Tom McDumbass any more than you have to, but when you hear this rhyme... Trigger warnings used to be on TV for seizures, and now they're everywhere to protect millennials' feelings. Like, uh, you hear how that barely connects as sounding like a rhyme? But with this lyric? You can hear the pattern of the rhyme scheme. What with how his sung delivery utilizes the impassioned singing in a way that makes the unstressed eh of both words match each other with the fall of his melodic lines. So when you hear the Bayan and Hawaiian, the delivery of it registers as working in conjunction with the heightened emotionality of how he's singing. So the result is a rhyme pattern that genuinely feels comfortable to the ear when you hear it in the reality of the moment. But getting out of hyper-focusing rap critic mode, it's just a general joy to listen to, with every second of it having something you want to sing along with. My favorite part being the almost Shabba Ranks dance hall invocation in this part. Was hoping I could catch you throwing smiles in my face. Romantic. Okay, you don't even have to try. My only complaint is that I wish it was longer. In the longer version I could find, the Satan mix is barely 30 seconds longer. It doesn't even reach the three minute mark. Like. God damn it, somebody give me an extended dance remix of this shit, because this dude keeps playing with my emotions. But yeah, it just feels like it's everything. The rhyme patterns, the pop song earworminess, the fun, playful guitar that helps it stick out just that much from the synth sludge that comprises most of the uncreative pop stuff that clogs up most of the radio. It all accumulates to yet another unconventional banger the man can add to his track record. This track really took me aback with how its musicality and lyricism pulls you into the depths of his mind state, starting with foreboding words and a chilly, hollow-feeling intro. And 
how when the rap starts, the music vibrates out of control, crashing against the emotionality and longing in the verse's delivery. With the song's title Sisyphus, representing the eternal strain he's been feeling about trying to keep a relationship with a loved one together despite it feeling like it's only going to keep slipping away into despair. The imagery of the lyrics matching the hazy feel of what's occurring behind his rhymes. And I just want to live in a motherfucking log cabin in a place where you never have to call back, never have to log back in. I've been back logged and black logged and fall back in. Too many times it wasn't all madness. It's a track that blends all these different genre elements of trap beats, rock music, and lo-fi to etch a dark personification of trudging through his emotional journey. I can't stress enough how well the music here works in tandem to punctuate his words. Even a couplet like that that was obviously going to touch a nerve for what everyone's going through right now hits you that much harder with how it's executed. If you're feeling the cold sting of going through some shit that feels like it's never getting anywhere, definitely let this track be a balm for your pain. Best listen to it in car speakers so the vibration can surround you and rumble in your goddamn soul as you hear it. So there's a million rap songs out there about being a dangerous guy you shouldn't fuck with, but this shit made you goddamn feel the menace of his presence. Just his voice alone sounds like he's in the middle of biting someone's guts out, uh, like they recorded this with his victim's viscera still between his teeth. Each line conveys this snarling, playfully devilish energy in how he spits his bars, going full Freddy Krueger movie nursery rhyme at one point. Jesus Christ, I was being metaphorical when I said he was eating motherfuckers. I forgot he actually said that shit. I always get a kick out of this part of him interrupting his counting pattern for that quick unexpected jab at cops, which the number 12 is a common street code for. That's gotta be tied in the race for my favorite hip hop moment of 2021, right next to the hook, which just makes the fucking song. What the fuck is that? What the fuck is that? That's how I step on nigga. Like, Jesus. No other lyric this year had me just as amused by the cleverness of the subversion of expectation as I was terrified by the implications. Virtually every lyrics heightens the intimidating feel the song's going for. Okay, that, that was a little cheesy, but I bet nobody's willing to say that shit to his face. Of course I had to show some love to North Carolina's very own, who comes through on this track brandishing a brilliant combo of metaphors and multi-syllabic rhymes. Uh, applying pressure, starting my crime with crime festers, and now I'm showing like they ain't a second try messers. Round crack vibes and cold-blooded killers, no reptiles, just projectiles for niggas off to you rocking the fresh and sex tab. And he does that thing again that's kind of becoming his calling card where, where he sounds like he's condescending to a lesser MC. Versus hit hard, never pitched hard, to play the streets, these niggas whips hard, behind closed doors, can't pay the lease. Only to switch it around and instead end up actually kind of empathizing with him. Ain't nothing wrong with living check to check, cause most have so his critique suddenly takes on this unexpectedly benevolent tone as he twists what starts off feeling like a diss into like legit advice on how they can improve and stand out as an artist. Instead of Captain, why don't you talk about being a broke rapper? That's a perspective I respect because it's real. What it's like to be nice as fuck, but gotta stress to pay the bills. And then wraps it around to his experience in a way that's honest about his flaws, but still manages some slick one-liners. I can say that I never scratch my jealousy ditch, but they gotta conquer that, cause if not, I'd never be rich. Money ain't everything, I never say that. But niggas throw stones knowing they sell they soul to get wherever they at. And we keep your pockets empty, so just focus on you. If you broke your clown and a millionaire, the joke is on you. So once again, J. Cole cooks up something that evades definition as a strict diss, elevating and putting a strangely jovial spin on what it means to make a brag track, so I had to give him props on it. Although he then goes on this rant at the end where he talks himself up in a way that does get a little repetitive after a while. Two hours later. Meanwhile, there's the sample he's talking over that sounds like way more important. In fact, when I looked it up, it turns out it was a Martin Luther King speech. And it's like, dude, stop speaking over MLK, man. I, I want to hear that shit. So, as she does, Megan the Stallion comes through with an epic baddie anthem, pumping a steady middle finger to respectability politics through her crass, boisterous sex rhymes, dishing out an anthem for black women who take their bodily autonomy into their own hands and want to shake their stankin' asses however they please. Uh, what the hell? 
yeah, I had no idea what the deal was with this part whenever I heard it. But then when I looked it up, it, it turns out it was a recording of her boyfriend who was apparently super cross about her going out to party at clubs because of it being the main place where dudes try to hit on chicks. But like, dude, you're dating Megan the Stallion. It, it's like pretty much her job to hang out and be sexy at clubs. Like, what were you expecting? Like, sure, I can understand feeling a little uncomfortable knowing dudes are going to hit on her. But if the relationship's secure between the two of you, what would there be to worry about? And this isn't the first time it's been brought up on a song that she's dealt with dudes who are oddly touchy about her flaunting her sexuality. I ain't perfect, can I try to fix the shit that ain't working? But it's 2020, I ain't finna argue about twerking. Yeah, I just don't get it. What person would have these hangups and still decide to date the chick who makes songs where she says, Be like crack when I hit it like dope, got a real hot pot, but a fish don't smoke. The whole thing is shot, but they ain't in my caliber book, but I squeeze a little head in my calendar, looking in the mirror like, damn, I'm bragging up. Interestingly enough, though, the pure sex talk is actually pretty scaled back on this track and really cuts through past her typical joints with some pretty banging punches and one liners. I was trying to call me a snake, shit, I guess I can relate, because a bitch bit a whole lot of dinner. Since these hoes all rest when they come around me, all I see is a whole lot of dinner. I'm 2021, finna graduate college. Shot that shit, I'm a real hot topic. It's dry, hey, trying to get noticed. Man, ain't nobody come to see you, Otis. Like, you know a line is hot when it brings an old movie clip back into internet circulation. They come in to see the temptations. Ain't nobody coming to see you, Otis. Like, damn, David Ruffin, you ain't have to go after the basement member of the temptations like that. But yeah, that's what I'm talking about. This track is just filled with that slick talking shit that puts the haters in their fucking place. She even double dimes her cadence into the third verse while still staying sharp with the rhymes. And you can hear her really amping up the energy at the end to drive it home. It makes the track hit like a planted flag, a stake in the game to the claim of being the premier femcy shit talker. And well, I dare you to tell her otherwise. If the name Coda the Friend didn't give it away, this guy's whole vibe is about being positive and inclusive. Thank you, Jesus, for the job of Allah. Please insert whatever you believe in. Celebrating this abundant season. And this song was my favorite of his from the year, with a the theme about just appreciating all of the blessings in his life. Even when I'm down bad, I'll be saying thank you. Even when I'm wild well sad, I can never hate you. And more than that, his whole persona revolves around spreading positivity despite what others may throw back. I'ma be great when you showing me love. I'ma be great when you throwing me hate. I done came a long way from the person I was. They be throwing me the pain and I let it all come. I don't ever shoot back. I just send them back love. Making the point in the song that the hate we pass on usually stems from unresolved trauma that we haven't gotten over. Now my gun go in love for you and love for you and you and you. We only human. We deserve it. Trauma really. You been hurting. I've been hurting. We've been searching. I've been learning. So his very impetus as an artist is rooted in spreading positivity to counteract that negativity. I've been working tables turning. Life get good when you moving with love. Even being thankful for the not so great things for still being part of the journey. Thank you for the setbacks on the way up. Thank you for the stories that they made up. And using himself as an example of how pushing toward your goals through adversity is part of caring about yourself. Get up and I get it on the worst day. Self care, nigga, that's the first thing. Woke up feeling like yes, now I got another day and I'm doing my best. Grind team chilling on the work day. And when you get it, I hope you are grateful. Dude's music is a warm shot of optimism in a seemingly ever grim world, so it only felt right to include this song for how it functions as an uplifting affirmation to contrast against what we're all going through. See, on this one, it starts off feeling like it's gonna be a typical brag rap joint. And there's like little mentions of some relationship he's tangled up in at first. But it feels like it's gonna be something he'll end up treating dismissively. Even here, he's essentially saying, hey, I'm bisexual, so we could just thruple up anyways. Who even cares? And it feels like that just might be the case. Like, he's a rapper. Of course he's gonna talk big on how he's gonna get over it because he's got a bunch of money, so hey, nothing's gonna phase him. Try to take somebody, bitch, because I'm a bad person. I don't regret shit because I worked it. In the end, she picked him. I hope when he fuck in, she's still thinking of me because I'm that person. But as the track continues, you hear him slowly fall apart in a real way as the brag rap side turns out to be a facade. You can tell it really is getting to him that he was the one that was cut out. You can feel the weight of the relationship on his mind start to pull at him, despite trying to use his cash and literally the music behind him to drown out his sorrows, all while the tone of the delivery gives away that it's clearly not working. Even ending on his brag on being on a yacht genuinely comes across like a cold comfort in the face of not being able to get over the loss of this person in his life. Like, a lot of rap songs usually come off as pretty disingenuous when they 
talk about spending G's to get through a heartbreak. I mean, I don't actually believe someone like Future is having a hard time when he talks about indulging in his riches to get over a past lover. But here, dude legit feels like he's losing it. And it reflects in the manic quality of the music as well as the emotionally charged delivery of his words as the song progresses. It's a brag track that falls apart at the seams as his feelings bleed through and crack away at the tough guy rapper stick by the end. And you really feel it as it hits him. Plus, the rest of the album really expands on that emotional journey. So seriously, give that Call Me If You Get Lost LP a listen when you get a chance. Well, the song is called Planned Parenthood, so here's your bread tube social commentary portion of the episode. But yeah, the rapper Locksmith plays out a scenario between a father and daughter's perspective on whether or not she should be allowed to get an abortion. Starting with the father, who of course uses his religious views to browbeat her onto his side. Dear God, we sit and we pray for your blessings. We're thankful and grateful that we can all gather together in front of your presence. And the verse, I dare say, pretty accurately portrays the spirit of these people's types of arguments. We recently found out she's pregnant and I'll be able to burden to scare her direction. She wants to go visit the clinic, but we believe life begins at conception. And there are some parts that sound kind of silly as the dad lays out his points. And what's even worse are these criminal liberals pushing their rhetoric further. They tell us that killing a baby's okay and judge us for eating a burger. You plant based, but we got base. Get your demonic proper out of my face. But like, you know there are people who think and talk like this. The type of people who push back out of spite because my freedom of choice anytime someone brings up healthier alternatives to stuff. Oh, you want a plant-based burger? Well, I'll take a Bubba's bubbling bacon back beef burger with buttered buns and bourbon sauce, you hippie. Mango white claw. But that, but that nothing. There'll be no abortion. End of discussion. Life is a gift and I will not return it. If God is the sin that he feels we deserve it. And you know, on one level, I, I want to say that you should respect people's religious differences on the matter. But fuck that, because when you look into the book that they're actually claiming authority from it, don't even say the shit that they say that it's saying! Seriously, look it up. There's literally no passage in the Bible that says abortions are bad or morally wrong. In fact, the closest thing addressing the topic of abortion is a passage from Exodus that says if someone attacks a woman in a way that causes a miscarriage, the penalty for the person responsible would be a monetary fine, treating it like a loss of property, unlike the fine for killing a person, which would be life for life in those days. So, according to the people of the Bible who were trying to model their laws as to what was fair in God's eyes, a fetus that isn't fully formed and still needs the womb to survive is seen as a woman's property and not yet to be equated with a fully autonomous human being. So, like, sure, if someone damages her property, there's gonna be a fine, but if it's her property, she can do whatever she wants with it, which would include terminating it if she doesn't feel she's in the right condition to raise it. And, like, isn't that kind of crazy to hear? Judging by the discourse you hear from the evangelical voting bloc, you'd think it explicitly said, God said no abortions ever. But no, according to their own book, a fetus is literally not equated to the same level as an autonomous life. Like, straight up, why do we gotta perpetually deal with what these types of people think the religious rules are, when as soon as you look into it, it's not even what they say it is? Like, doesn't that make you really look sideways at these so-called religious folks? Like, we caught you. you. You clearly ain't even really reading your own shit. In fact, it wasn't even treated as a debate until about the 70s when conservative politicians explicitly pushed it as a wedge issue to jerk voters who hadn't really thought about it onto their side with a purely emotion-based argument. Well, the Democrats want to let people kill babies, so clearly they're the bad guys and you shouldn't vote for them, am I right? Planned Parenthood is a tool of the devil created to keep us from breathing sterile. Yeah, there's a pretty big conservative segment of the black population that thinks like this. And it pulls, of course, from the general uneasiness black people have about the U.S. government in general, but unfortunately it's a paranoia that in this case has been exaggerated once again by conservative politicians spreading misinformation to push black voters on their side. Like, even I had received wisdom about Margaret Sanger, the inventor of the birth control pill, being racist, but I had processed it like, yeah, you know, okay, the creative of technology may have bigoted views, but, you know, that doesn't make the advancements in technology any less important to have. But as it turns out, when I researched for this episode, even those claims of her being an out-and-out -out racist eugenics advocate were based on false quotes conservatives purposely sped around to smear her reputation. But getting back to the song, in the second verse, the daughter rightfully comes back at him. But father, you're not being practical. You see my life through a lens, but it's fractional. You pick and choose what you use as a measure and stick your opinion restricts what is rational. You say I'm sad religiously, but dad, I've seen your browser history. And you know, it feels like a cheap, easy blow to be like, oh, but the dad's a hypocrite. But like, this is real. This is how a lot of guys can be. Quick to come down on others for their sexual choices, but not exactly living up to the same standard themselves. I know that you speak from a hurt place, but you wouldn't want to stand with a birth text if you weren't so opposed to talking about sex. You could have avoided this in the first place. Specifically taking him to task for a very common trait conservative dads have, where they avoid any and all open discussion about sex with their daughters until they get pregnant, and then now they're all too ready to lecture on what she's supposed to do. 
And I think the figures are pretty much in on how well abstinence-only education does in preventing underage pregnancies. And that's just true shit. The more kids are left in the dark about sex, the more they're going to make sexual mistakes. So to tell them to be mature and take on a whole ass potential life feels unfair when you didn't allow them to be properly informed on anything before the unwanted pregnancy occurred. And who's gonna help when this baby arrives? But you and my mate, we can barely survive. You expect me to just take off of work but still pay you for rent and take classes full time? And yeah, the demographic most vulnerable to the situation are uneducated, lower-class girls who get stripped of their ability to choose their life path by a society that wants them to work their fingers to the bone to sustain a child but are constantly cutting social programs that would help make it easier for them. But if more clicks close, then we're forced to wait. And if we're forced to wait, then it shakes reservations. That's the reason women have late terminations. That's the reason I don't go to church for the saving. Talking about God, but they work it for safe. Just so you know, yeah, that pastor you signed with, this is his baby, I'm tired of hiding it. And sure, th again, on the songwriting level, making the pastor into a hypocrite, it, it feels like another cheap and easy plot point to get you to sympathize with their perspective. But again, it, it's not like this doesn't happen, because it most definitely does, and calls into a recurrent pattern in our society where men take advantage of their authority over young girls and then leave them with the sole task of taking responsibility while not giving them a choice in the matter. Like, to be frank, the fact that this situation in America essentially equates to a bunch of rich old white guys that get to make laws that mostly affect poor women of color seems like a fucked up way of going about deciding things in the first place, right? So, like, guys, can, can we just get the fuck out of women's way and just let them fucking choose already? And the number one song on the list is about dealing with dysfunctional family issues. Who can relate? Woo. How many times did I cry for this? I would hate myself if I didn't at least try for this. But more than that, it's specifically about her relationship with her distant father. It being in the middle of contemplating if you're actually gonna follow through with trying to mend fences. Will the pressure take me too high? So be my demise. Will my intentions coincide with what I advise? So she's like, okay, I know it's a good thing to write a song advocating for people to do this, but like, am I really gonna be able to do it? The pain fresh hope will determine if you survive. I'm amazed by it. I lied into myself pretending I was never faced by it. Maybe because you're in my DNA, that's why. And here she laments being so guarded about her emotions to others, including her dad, who she seems to have cut off because of his callousness, but then catches herself like, oh shit, th that guarded way of living is exactly like you, so dang, maybe we actually have more in common than I wanted to believe. My ego won't fully allow me to say that I miss you, a woman who hasn't confronted all her daddy issues. But, you know, it's not like she doesn't still have her reasons. The day will come when you brought a final answer to your sins. But at the same time, she explores his life to empathize and see through his lens as someone dealing with the reality of raising a kid for the first time and the stresses that came with it. Pressures are provided, feeling unhappy within. I understand what's in a need and an escape. The track personifies that weird transition you make as you get older where you go from a kid who only looks to a parent figure as an adult who's supposed to know all the answers and so you get angry when they don't fulfill that perfect role you think a parent should be, to growing up and seeing that they were once a kid too, and became who they were through their own journey of trying to feel their way through a world that they weren't fully prepared for either. And while she ruminates over the mental tug of war she's having with herself over engaging with him, she also mentions that it's ultimately just talking about the things that hurt that's the only way to resolve things, laying out the power and magic that words have to release the reality of years-long tension that's gone unspoken. However, she can't help but express doubt on if she can actually do so, because it still requires both parties to care about making the effort, so she worries if the effort would fall on deaf ears. Everything is a choice and anything can be said. Is you missing the point? Are you just hearing me vent? Or is you been understanding knowing my words will connect? But she still pushes through because of the mental space it takes up that makes you unable to stop thinking about these conflicts in the first place. It's an explosively poignant tour to force a rapper who's truly pulling you into the different facets of forgiveness and self-discovery. It reads like a real cracking of the shell in terms of trying to move beyond a psychological barrier to become more sympathetic to someone they were typically averse to. And hey, is the kind of emotional journey we could all stand to take some notes on in our personal lives. Well, I hope I left you with some dope music and artists to check out. Leave a like if you liked because it helps, comment if you have something to say because it helps even more, and hit the subscribe button and the bell afterwards because the bell is what helps the most. Oh yeah, and follow me on Twitch to check out my music and gaming streams, follow me on Twitter and IG to know when those streams are happening, and of course support me on Patreon to join the RC Discord and chat with me and fellow fans. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you next time. Peace!